Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the TED Colloquium. Today we're very happy to have our very own Luke Postle, uh, who will tell us about further progress towards Hadwiger's conjecture. Luke. All right, thank you, David. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, start starting the term. So today I'll be talking about Hadwiger's conjecture, which maybe you've heard of. So I thought I'd start with some history. Um, so for those who are new or incoming grad students, just go over coloring again. So one of the fundamental topics in graph theory, so a K coloring of graph is an assignment of colors, one to K, such that no two adjacent vertices receive the same color. We say G is K colorable if G has a K coloring. And we're interested in minimizing the number of colors, so we look at the chromatic number of G denoted chi of G as the smallest K such that G has a K coloring. And I drew a little graph at the bottom there's a five coloring, but then you can actually make it better and make it three, and you need three for odd cycles. So that's actually the chromatic number there. Uh, so coloring, you know, many results on, many uh, centuries of work here, but that brings me to our second topic, which is not coloring, but rather minors, another foundational uh, topic in graph theory. So we say that a graph G has an H minor if a graph isomorphic to H can be obtained from a subgraph of G by contracting edges. So you're allowed to delete edges and vertices, that's the subgraph, and then you're allowed to contract edges. So in the example here, I used that same graph. I deleted the vertex, this the little pendant vertex, and then I contracted the two edges in red to make a triangle. So it has a, a K3 minor there. But maybe a more useful way to think about minors, which you might not be used to, is as models. So let H be a graph. A model of H is a collection of vertex disjoint connected subgraphs where that for every uh, V, I, V, J in E, that's an edge in H, you actually, they're adjacent, that there's an edge with one end in H, I, and the other end in H, J. So here, uh, before I had the contractions, actually, if you just kind of undo the contractions, you'll get the connected subgraphs. So V1 can be pulled back to H1, V2 to H2, V3 to H3, and, and sure enough, then there must be some edge with one end in each, and they'll have to be, they'll be connected because they got contracted to a vertex. So but this is a more useful way to think about building minors is to actually find a model in the graph instead of actually trying to find the right sequence of steps to make the minor. So we'll be using that. And then it's not hard to see, it's probably obvious now from uh, the pullback that G has an H minor and if and only if there exists a model of H and G. And kind of an interesting question is, do coloring and minors have any relation? I mean. These are two fundamental topics in graph theory. Should they have any relation? It's not really clear. They're, you know, if you know Hadwiger's, you're used to that idea, but I think you should step back and say, like, that's weird, right? I mean, coloring is partitioning into independent sets and, and you know, finding like complete minors or models is finding like connected subgraphs with lots of edges between. Why should these concepts be at all related? Why should having, being able to find lots of connections somehow be related to, you know, divvying into to edgeless subsets? I mean, intuitively we want to believe that they're connected somehow, but it, it's, it's not clear that they should have a connection or, or in fact a very nice connection, but that's exactly what Hadwiger's conjecture posits. So in 1943, Hadwiger conjectured that for every t at least one, every graph with no k t minor is t minus one colorable. So that there's a very strong connection that if you forbid complete minors, you can actually color and with the number of colors kind of that, that you hope for from forbidding a clique. But here we have to forbid the minors. And so it's you know one of the most probably well-known problems in graph theory, you know, it's one of the hardest, but uh, you know, old, and the point really is that it, it, and we'll see this in a second, it generalizes the four color theorem. So it's one of the main directions you can go to try to generalize the four color theorem away from planar graphs into more general graphs. But let me just review the, the known cases. So Hadwiger and independently Dirac had proved it for T at most four. So for one and two, it's, it's just kind of trivial. For three, it's that if you uh, don't have a K3 minor that cycles, then you're too colorable. That's the bipartite result. And then four is, is a little bit harder, but uh, it's about series parallel graphs. It, you can show they have degree two vertices, and so you can show they're three colorable. And then it gets hard. 
So Wagner in 1937, even actually before Hadwiger made the conjecture, showed that the T equal five case is equivalent to the four color theorem. And that was of course the four color conjecture at the time, but it was eventually proved by Appel and Hocken in 1977. So again, this T equal four, five case here is, is a four color theorem. So this generalizes the four color theorem. And actually the next case was proved by Robertson, Seymour and Thomas in 1993. And they showed that it's also equivalent. So basically they gave 150 page proof, uh, which without computers or anything just by hand, but reducing the, that case to the four color theorem. So they showed that every counter example is apex. It's planar plus a vertex. And then you can invoke the four color theorem to five color those graphs. And so if you use that as a black box, it's true. But beyond that, it's open. It's open for T greater than or equal to seven and seems very, very hard to prove any more cases. And so that's kind of been the status of the, the actual conjecture for special cases. Uh, but maybe you could ask for weakenings. So instead of asking, can we actually prove Hadwiger's for more T, maybe a different question is to ask, what can we prove about the coloring, the chromatic number when you forbid a KT minor? So one direction of this is, let's not even hope for exactly T, is there just a linear relation? Can we prove linear Hadwiger's conjecture? And this was made by Reed and Seymour, 98, Karbashi Moore, 07 reiterated it, that, you know, is there some constant C, so no, every graph with no KT minor is CT color. And that would be very nice, you know, to prove even if C was gigantic, but even this is still open. So what is known? Well, how do you color graphs? So an easy way to color graphs, as you might know, is using degeneracy. So a graph G is D degenerate if every subgraph of G has a vertex of degree at most D. And then you can apply greedy, right? You just delete, you go by induction, you only see D colors, so there's a color if they're at least D plus one to color you. So if you're D degenerate, you're D plus one colorable. But that raises the question, what is the degeneracy of graphs with no KT minor? And this uh, was actually solved. So Kostochka and Thomason independently in the early 80s proved that every graph with no KT minor is O T root log T degenerate and hence is OT root log T colorable. And actually Thomason in 2001 had actually figured out exactly the constant that goes there to be tight for the degeneracy. So there's kind of a natural bound and it comes from, we're saying that if you forbid a KT minor, you're doing something about the edges, about the average degree. And so you can get information about the coloring just because of the degree considerations. So that's really using no coloring at all to give this, this bound right? It's just something about structure. And so that's a bit unsatisfying because it's saying, okay, we've kind of done something with Hadwiger's, but we didn't actually use any coloring. We didn't figure out any relation, right, beyond this degree bound. And that had been the state of the art basically since, since you know, until very recently. So for almost 40 years, this was the best general bound. I should say there were uh, some relative and a couple of improvements. Thomas in 2001 had found the right constant. Wood had uh, 2013 subtracted off a bit. And then with my student Tom, who was here, we improved the front constant by a 0.998 factor. But there had been really no movement in, in that t root log t other than the constant factor. And that's where it had remained until last fall. So there was a very big breakthrough by Noreen and Song, and they showed that for every beta, at least 0.354, every graph with no KT minor is OT log T to the beta colorable. So they actually broke this T root log T barrier and got it down to T log T to this kind of weird number. It comes from you know, some uh, equation, uh, but 0.354. And, and so this was a, a very big step because essentially there, there was this um, commonly expressed counter conjecture that maybe the right answer is degeneracy. Maybe the right answer is T root log T for Hadwiger's. And we just don't know how to, we don't know the example yet. And this showed that actually that counter conjecture is false. It's not the right answer, T root log T. You can do better. And that, you know, as mathematicians begs the question, you know, what, what can we do better? What is the right answer? I mean, 0.354 does not seem like a very natural number. Certainly that can't be it. Uh, and so then improving on their proof, so using their same strategy, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, but improving one of their key ingredients, I was able to improve this 
to every beta greater than a quarter. So you can get OT log T, you know, quarter, but you know, there's like a little error term. So if you kind of forget about that, you just say beta greater than quarter, then this is true. And we ended up combining our two papers and merging them into just kind of to one paper um, that does this nice kind of gets you from the half to the quarter. So I thought that was really nice. I mean, I, I could almost believe maybe some other counter conjecture that maybe quarter is the right answer. That sounds like a natural thing, right? I mean, it'd be a little weird, but it would be pleasing, you know, somewhere between. Um, so that was the state of the art until last fall. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about that proof in our goes because we'll need to, to do it. But in the meantime, there's been uh, more and different progress. So one, I want to talk about generalizations. So give a shout out to those. So uh, there's been a lot of weakenings of Hadwiger's conjecture where you change the independent sets to max degree uh, you know, bounded or maybe bounded component size, and those have been proved. But there's also strengthenings, which is a bit weird because Hadwiger's conjecture is so hard. Why well, make strengthenings? But people did. So here was one, uh, if you haven't heard of it, is odd minor. So we say a graph G contains H as an odd minor if a graph isomorphic to H can be obtained from a subgraph G prime of G by contracting a set of edges forming a cut in G prime. So you want the minor in a very specific kind of odd way. And Odd Hadwiger's conjecture was made by Gerards and Seymour, at least by the early 90s, and it says that basically every graph with no odd kt minor is t minus one colorable, and this would be very nice. And uh, the best known general result had been this result of Jim's, uh, Gerard, Reed, Seymour, and Veda from 2008, matching that t root log t. So unfortunately, the degeneracy thing uh, doesn't really work because bipartite graphs don't have odd k3 minors, so you can't get a, an average degree down down there, but they actually do, you know, they're two colorable, so they're not counter examples. And they were able then to match up with the Kostochka Thomson bound. And that had been the state of the art of odd Hadwigers until, again, kind of this last year. So Nareem and Song had done 0.354 uh, for odd minors, and then using kind of the machinery for my ha uh, quarter result they actually extended that to the odd minor case as well. So for odd minors, we know t log t to the beta for every beta greater than a quarter. And that's the state of the art on the odd minor Hadwiger conjecture. So odd Hadwigers. There's a different generalization, which is to list color. So you might have heard of that. So we say a graph G is k list colorable if for every assignment of list L of V of colors to the vertices of G, you can get a coloring where every vertex is colored from its list. So instead of having just lists one up to, to k, you're allowed different lists. And this ends up being harder than coloring. But it would be natural to try to conjecture Hadwiger's for that. However, uh, Margie Voigt had shown that in 1993, actually, there exists a planar graph that is not for list colorable. And hence, list Hadwiger's is actually also false uh, for that. But you might have wondered maybe you know, there are five lists colorable by a result of Thomason. So you might think maybe it's just off by one, you know, so it's in spirit kind of true, but actually Barat, Jaure, and Wood had shown in 2011 using kind of voids, but generalizing the construction, constructed graphs with no K3T plus two minor, which are not four T lists colorable for every T. So actually you can't even do better than kind of four thirds as a ratio. However, linear Hadwigers is, could still be true. That's not known to be False. Maybe even a three halves is true, for example. Uh, and that was kind of, uh, so it's false, but maybe we could still hope for better bounds. I should mention then the Kostachka and Thomason degeneracy bounds also work for list coloring. So it was known to be T root log T colorable, uh, again, dating from the 80s. And that was, again, the best bound until then improving on our work. Sergey and I uh, extended the T log T to the beta for every beta greater than a quarter to list coloring. So with some extra ideas. And so that also works for list coloring. So the list, we got to a quarter. The odd, unfortunately you can't merge the two because uh, as I said about the bipartite graphs, it could have unbounded uh, list chromatic number. So you can't get that, but you can extend that quarter in each direction. And those are the best results for each of those categories at the moment. However, this brings me back uh, to actually today's topic is not about those, it's about further progress. And so back to the original conjecture. Our main result for today is actually we can do this for every beta greater than zero. Every graph with no kt minor is ot log t to the beta color. 
So we can push that quarter down to zero with an error term. And then the question is, what is the term? What is the actual number? So we've broken this log barrier. You know, do we get some weird function? Originally I had it that, but then with some details I won't talk about in this talk. Uh, but you know, you can see on, on my archive uh, papers how they go. Uh, but I'll kind of mention where it comes up. We actually get this result. Every graph with no kt minor is ot log log t to the sixth colorable. So we've gone from the log realm to the log log realm, uh, which is very nice. And you'll see reasons why uh, there's kind of actually going to be natural sticking points. So the hope would maybe to improve the six, but there's definitely going to be natural uh, barriers coming from around t log log t. So I think to go beyond that is going to be very difficult, but maybe we can move the six a bit uh, further down. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Again, if you have any uh, questions, maybe mention it in the chat or raise a hand um, or keep them to the end. So that was the introduction. This is the result, but how do we get there? And what is the new ideas? Well, to tell you about the new ideas, I'm going to tell you about the quarter proof first. So this very nice uh, beta, gre beta greater than a quarter proof. And so I'll give you a proof overview of that because we're going to need various ingredients actually from that proof. So first thing we're going to need is coloring small graphs. So it actually turns out you can kind of color very small, so not t, but like t log, poly log t graphs with uh, like t log log t colors. And this follows from a result of Duche and Menil uh, in the early 80s who had shown that graphs with no kt minor have large independent sets, right? So if they were if categories was true, we'd expect an independent set of size at least the number of vertices over t minus one because you could just take the largest color class. And they had shown this basically, but with a, a weakening, so with a factor of two. And Woodall had actually shown the stronger result, then you can actually even find a subset of the vertices of at least half the size uh, who has chromatic number at most t minus one. And if you just repeatedly use that, you can show a kind of weird bound on uh, the chromatic number of graphs in terms of there's a t and then there's times kind of log of the number of vertices over t. So if t is like log, t log, if v is t log squared t, you get something like log, t log log t, so this kind of thing. So that's kind of one of the natural barriers. We don't actually know how to do small graphs better than this uh, corollary. Uh, so kind of a natural sticking point for the t log log t. But we can do small graphs any, you know, pretty well, like very small, very close to t. But, but this is actually very good because the, in the degeneracy uh, bound, the t root log t, the known tight examples were all this kind of small. They all, the random graphs that have around t root log t vertices. And so basically this, this simple corollary, which I won't prove, takes care of that. It shows we don't have to worry kind of about those random constructions, these really small graphs. And I'll just mention that uh, if you're interested, Reed and Seymour had generalized Duchesne and Menials from independent set to fractional coloring, which is between coloring and, and independent sets, showing that every graph no kt minor is fractionally 2t minus 1 color. So the fractional version of hadwig gertis well, at least the linear hadwig gertis is known to be true. And so there was that. So we'll need that result about coloring small graphs, and we need what we'll call a density increment theorem. What is that? Well, let the density of a graph G denoted DG be the edges over the vertices. So basically, it's related to uh, average degree, right? So that would be uh, having twice the density, but uh, we'll just use density for now. What's the question? So here's a very natural question. It's not about Hadwigers at all. When does a graph of density D have a minor of density big D? So what if we want to go from a graph with small density, but to find a minor with big density, right? This would actually be kind of useful because if we could go from like density T to density T root log T, then by kostatka thomason we could find a, a complete minor. And well, what's the obstruction to this? It turns out, well, in order to have a minor of density big D, you need to have at least d squared edges, big d squared edges. So if the number of vertices was actually smaller than d squared, big d squared over little d, you wouldn't have that many edges. And so very small graphs would be an obstruction. 
And you might think, well, made it the only one, but of course you could take the disjoint union of, of very small graphs. Uh, and they would also be obstructions. So these would be graphs of density kind of like D, but having uh, just not enough really edges in their components. So you might ask now the strange question, is this essentially the only obstruction? And the kind of next theorem will say, in spirit, yes. So what is this theorem? It says that for every s, at least one, there's some gs. So if you're a non-edgeless graph and you let d be s times d, so s is kind of the ratio of d over d, then you can either find your minor you want, uh, you know, with density big D, or you can find a subgraph that's small. So v of h is this d squared, big d squared over little d, but times gs. And the density is your original density, but also divided by GS. So you think of GS as kind of an error uh, term. So both in the size of the graph and in its density. But you can basically hope to find a small dense subgraph that kind of verifies this obstruction. And of course, this is meaningless because I didn't tell you what G of S is, so it doesn't make any sense. But let me tell you about G of S. So Noreen and Song had proved this in their paper uh, with G of S being S to the alpha for any alpha being 0 0.7095. So maybe that's not great because, um, you know, D squared over D is D times S. So you're, uh, you know, you're kind of increasing by a lot or losing a lot of density. And so that's what had given their weird 0 0.354. Uh, then I followed that up by actually improving that to S to the alpha for any alpha greater than zero. So basically you can get uh, sub-polynomial error terms and that's what can get you to a quarter. And you'll see, I'll tell about, talk about why you get a quarter in a bit. But I should note though, once we have our results from today, it becomes very important to answer, to improve this theorem. So I hadn't really tried much to improve the actual error term, I just was happy with sub-polynomial. But if you go back and you try to improve it, which I did this summer, because at the time you get uh, two to the log s to the two thirds, as if you work out the numbers, which is not very pretty and would lead to a two to the log log t to the two thirds for these results. But I went back this summer and actually improved this to one plus log s to the sixth. And s, again, you know, we need to go from t to t root log t. So s is root log t. If you put it in this, that's where the log log t is coming from. Log, well, log log t, unfortunately, to the sixth. So if we could improve this theorem to just be log, then you'd immediately improve Hadwiger's to t log log t. But that seems also kind of hard to me at this point. So that's this density increment theorem. What's the use of it? Well, basically, you can use it, as I just suggested, to find small dense graphs. Right? So if I'm a graph, and I say I had density at least k times f of t, f of t is just some number coming from this kind of putting root log t ratio in, uh, then, and you don't contain a kt minor, then the first outcome can't happen. And so you have to find a small dense subgraph. The number of vertices is t f t log t, and the density is at least, say, if you want 2k, why would you maybe want 2k? Well, there's Motter's theorem from 1972. If you have density at least 2k, then you can get a k-connected subgraph. And those will be very useful for building minors. So being connected is much more useful than actually being uh, dense. So we can upgrade this corollary to instead getting a k-connected subgraph that's very small. So we're dense, but we're even connected, highly connected, and we're uh, rather small, which is good because we can color small graphs again with not too many colors. And actually, you can just kind of repeat this. So if G is a graph with no KT minor and you had large chromatic number, you can just keep extracting these small dense graphs. They don't use too much chromatic number. And so at an additional factor of like 2T log FT and 6T log R, you can even get R of these dirtex disjoint ones, all small, all K connected. So that's very useful for building minors. And I'll show you how in a little bit for our quarter proof. But I need to introduce uh, two more uh, topic. So one you might know is called linked. So we say a graph G is K linked if for any set of vertices S1 up to SK, T1 up to TK, here's a picture, there exist internally vertex disjoint paths, PI, from SI to TI. So, you know, we want to get, so not just connected like Menger's, but we actually want S1 to get to T1 and S2 to get to T2 and SK to get to TK. 
uh, for any set. And here I'll even allow them to be the same vertices. So some of the S's and T's could be the same, but then we just have internally vertex disjoint. And Bola, Bosch, and Thomason in 1996 had actually shown that linear connectivity suffices, something like 22K connected to get you to be K-linked. So that's the important thing here, we'll need this linear, linear connectivity, and actually you can become K-linked. That's just a, a kind of a constant factor. So we'll need that, we'll actually need a generalization of that. So this is what uh, Noreen and Song were working with. So we, I called it woven. So we say a graph G is AB woven if for every three sets of vertices, R, S, and T, so here's a picture. So I have my SIs and my TIs, and if I have these new vertices R, R1 up to RA, uh, and what I wanna get is a complete model that's rooted at R. And all that means is R1 is in one part, R2 is in a different part, so each R is in a different part of the model. So really like when I do the contraction, R1 is really getting mapped to, you know, each R is getting a different vertex of the complete graph, that I can get both that and a linkage, this, this link, these paths at the same time. And again, I'll even allow the R's and S's to be the same if you're kind of internally disjoint for whatever that means. And what Noreen and Song had shown was actually, you can kind of get both Balabash and Thomason and the Kostachka Thomason all together that if you are A square root log A plus B connected, then you're AB woven, right? So we need the B connected for the bolabash thomason but the A square root log A should remind you of that square root log T, and so you can actually get rooted complete miters and you can get them both at the same time. So if you wanna link things and you want complete miners, we can do that. So how can we use that? Well, now I can kind of just easily do the quarter proof. So let's go through that. How do you build a miner for T log T to the quarter? Well, you let y be log t to the quarter, and you let x be t over y, which is t over log t to the quarter. And I just won't go into it because it'll be superseded by a thing I'll say later, but by work of Karbayashi, you can actually assume that a minimum counterexample to this kind of a Hadwigers is connected. So we can assume it's uh, t log t to the quarter ft connected, which is xy squared here. And by that corollary I just mentioned about picking out lots of subgraphs, you can actually find something like y squared plus y over two plus one different subgraphs that are highly connected, x, y squared connected. So I'll label them h0 and hij. So here's a picture. So you have this h0, and then I, you, it's best to think of them as in, in kind of in a matrix or rows, right? So you have h11, h12, h22, so on. And what I'm gonna do is in h0, I'm gonna choose vertices si, so s1, s2, kind of big blocks. And in HIJ, I'm gonna, they're not depicted, but I'm gonna pick blocks there called TIJ. And I'm gonna use these to build my minor, right? So I'm gonna build a KT, I, and XY minor. And how does that go? Well, since you're XY squared link, I can actually link up all these SIJKs and TIJKs. So there it only looks like there's one path, but actually each one of those paths is meant to represent X paths. So you're, you're doing lots of connecting. Uh, and the idea is so kind of I've, I want to build my KT minor. I break it into Y super blocks, each of size X. And then the idea is that I want to, you know, send each pair of blocks to their own private HIJ to try to make their, their, their adjacencies in that block. And I'm going to use H0 to do the linking. And how does this work? Well, so for every ij, for every little hij, I'm going to use those little subgraphs to build these miners. How do I do that? I use the woven property, right? Because it turns out they're xy squared connected. Uh, I want to build a 2x minor. I can do that by this Noreen Song woven theorem. So I can weave a, a complete minor on those, those parts. And I can even do this while preserving the path. So I want to preserve how to get the minor together. And I can do that by preserving the path. Now you might complain, wow, what if, you know, paths can run in and out and in and out. How can you do that? What if there's way too many paths? I don't have to actually preserve every part of the path if you look at the picture, like look at the blue line that goes in and out. I only need to preserve that I go from the start to the end. So if it dips in and out, I just take the first place and the last place and I just have to make sure they get linked inside HI to preserve the overall linkage. And so with that, I can actually do with their theorem. 
So basically, I just one at a time go through each of these blocks, build complete miners, preserving the overall connection back to the hub of H0. And then in H0, I can use bolabosch thomason or, or the Wolven theorem and just go ahead and link up, uh, you know, because each, each super vertex, each part of my model wants to go now to, to like a whole row or a column, but I can just link up each of those and then I can do this contraction. So I use one subgraph to do as a hub to make the connections and all the others to build like little small complete miners that I am connecting up with the overall linkage. So hopefully uh, if you have any questions about that, but so that's basically the proof that was a little quick, but I wanna move on. You know, but again, we're going to need these techniques about weaving and, and these same tricks about preserving for more generally. Because, you know, there's a natural place where the quarter comes in there. We needed x, y squared. So if you, if you work it out, the quarter naturally comes from this choice of x and y, and you can't really do better unless you change how you build a minor. So here are two additional ways to build a complete minor. So it, it took a good while of thinking about new ways to build miners, but you know, if, you're, if you know like the Alon Seymour time, a separator theorem for minor uh, closed families of graphs, it's, one of these will be kind of reminiscent of that. So, because the issue is in what I just showed, we just tried to build the minor all at once. We made all the subgraphs, you know, we did the whole linkage, we just built everything at once. And here's two additional ways to do it, recursive and sequential. So one idea is to recursively build your minor. So instead of building a KT minor or model, let's actually build like three K2T over three models. Let's you know, divide it into thirds and build a complete minor here and here and here and link them up. So build a KT by kind of you know, in three parts, right? So that would be one way, kind of recursively building your minor and then recurse inside those. Uh, so that's a very nice and attractive way. And the other is, is let's not do it all at once, but let's do it sequentially. So maybe let's successively build up a KT model by adding say like square root log T new vertices at a time. So let's add a couple new parts and connect them all up, a couple new parts, connect them all up. Okay, well that's all grand and, and dandy, but I mean, it's easier said than done, right? I mean, how do we actually use these? So that brings us to the question, do you see the problem is in each case, whether you're going recursively or sequentially, instead of all at once, you would need like many large or highly connected subgraphs, right? You need, like if you're going recursively, we need kind of to know that there's a real recursion levels of subgraphs. Or if you're going sequentially, we need to know that there are more highly connected subgraphs to use. And is, I mean, okay, like we use the density theorem to get one level, those, those, those very small ones, but is there any guarantee there's somewhat like not incredibly small graphs in, in your inside that are decently connected? Like what resource do we have for forcing large graphs? And this is where it comes in actually. The chromatic number shows up again. So in our quarter proof, really the only place we really use the chromatic number is to color small graphs. And then we did some tricks with these miners. And here actually, if we use the chromatic number again in, in, as a resource, we can actually make build miners better. And how do we do that? Well, you know, do you see they of course force large, right? If you have large chromatic number, we know from our small graph result, you'd have a decent number of vertices. Is that also enough to guarantee high connectivity? Well, Karabayashi had given you something, but that was only minimum counterexamples. And actually, importantly, there's this very nice new result from just this year in the spring uh, by Girao and Narayanan uh, which was answering a question that Sergey had posed about in relation to Hadwiger's, and it's this. It's not about Hadwiger's at all, it just says, for every positive integer k, if g is a graph with at least chromatic number 7k, then you can get a k-connected subgraph without losing too much in the chromatic number. You only lose 6k. So, you know, imagine that k is actually very tiny compared to the chromatic number, then you're saying, for basically nothing, I can keep my chrom chromatic number high and make it k-connected. And so you could actually use that instead of the Karabayashi thing I've alluded to. But actually, this is very powerful. We'll just keep using this result over and over again. And you know, if you haven't seen this paper, maybe go read it, because the proof is only like four pages. It's just kind of from the book. It's, it's, it's textbook. And it's surprising that it took so long for anyone, to, well, maybe to think of the question, and then also to immediately come around and proving it. Um, but it's going to be one of our key building blocks. OK, so now that we have that in hand, so we knew chromatic number and we have Girao Narayanan to give us connectivity. 
how do we go about doing this? Well, here's where we break into cases. So how does this go? Uh, here's the key definition. So I, I already kind of set it up for you, recursive sequential, so we're gonna do it that way, but we're gonna go by this definition. Uh, we say a graph is S-chromatic separable if there exists two vertex disjoint subgraphs, H1 and H2 of G, that have high chromatic numbers. So chi at least chi of G minus S. So only lose a little bit. Uh, and that is, and we say it's S chromatic and separable otherwise. So I mean, it's easy to split a graph into two subgraphs with chromatic number about half the size, half the original chromatic number. You know, just go through the vertices, find the breaking point. But here we're asking for, we're gonna ask for a lot more. So we're gonna think that S is very tiny, you know, is it possible to always find, you know, like two very highly chromatic number disjoint subgraphs? Well, no, not in cliques and things like that, but maybe, you know, we can deal with the cases separately. Can we separate into two high chromatic subgraphs or not? And so actually that's what we do, but we actually do it uh, maybe better to think you're kind of always separable or separable for a very long time or you're inseparable. So here are the two lemmas. In the always separable case, we'll show that if you have chromatic number S log log T, S is at least T, and every subgraph with at least half of the chromatic number is separable, then G contains a KT minor. So we'll build a minor in this kind of, your all large chromatic subgraphs are separable, and then we'll build a minor in the inseparable case. So there, if your T log log T inseparable, and your chromatic number is at least that, here's a T log log T, but there's also that TFT, unfortunately. You get that log T, log log T to the sixth there, and then you contain a KT minor. So this is the main, so if, if you don't pay attention to the rest of the talk where I go through how to actually build these, the main takeaway is using chromatic number as a resource uh, with the separability idea and kind of building it in two different ways. And I think that's very nice and natural. So let me go through uh, one last thing. So how do you put it all together? It should be kind of obvious. So you let S be T log log T and you know, the, by the always separable case would just say, well, then I get a KT minor. So actually I'd have to have some high chromatic inseparable graph and then you would just apply the inseparable lemma and do that. So let me talk about the always separable case. So that's the recursive case. So that's where you maybe could have seen it. We're gonna recurse into different subgraphs. So let me actually show something slightly stronger. We wanted to get a KT minor. Let me actually show that you're T zero woven. And we'll let A and B, and you'll see why in a second, be suggestive. A will be T and B will be zero, so it'll be A zero woven. Well, if you're separable, then by definition, there's two disjoint subgraphs where you don't lose too much, right? So let's just take those two subgraphs. Now, two isn't good enough for the thing I wanted to do, so we'll actually, again, use the always separable and apply that to this H zero prime to get two more called H two prime and H three prime that only lose a little bit more, right? So Separability is kind of an illusion. You don't need two, you know, we, from there we can easily get, if we're always separable, three or four or whatever you want. But three will be enough for our purposes. But then we also need to make them connected. So we'll make, you use the girau naranian theorem to make each of these connected. And actually, maybe I forgot to say, you should originally make the original graph G also K connected when you're doing this as well. So make it, assume it's connected, and then we can find three disjoint, pretty high chromatic and decently connected subgraphs. What do we do with that? Then we just kind of do our weaving tricks. So, you know, we want to say we want to show you're woven. So R is some set R1 up to RA, divide it into thirds, R1, R2, R3, and then go into each H1, H2, H3, and make a set T1, T2, and T3. You can see the definitions there, but maybe the picture will make more sense. Now we apply the linkage theorem, Bolabosch Thomason, to say, well, since we're 2A linked, there would actually exist paths. So we can get R1 and R2 over to T1 in H1. We can get R1 and R3 into the middle. We can get R2 and R3 to the side. So like, you know, you, each pair of thirds you send to their own private subgraph, right? Now, uh, as I, maybe I was less clear back in the old plan, but here I try to make a point with that last path. These paths don't have to just neatly go over to H1. They can wind them, or H3, they can just wind through all of these subgraphs which is bad, but now our plan is to recursively weave models just as before, right? So what do we have? Now inside H1, we want to build a complete minor on T1, which is 2A over three vertices, while preserving any of the paths that wound through H1. And you do this for each of them. And so we get like a table. 
So if we originally started with, you know, we wanted a KT minor and we didn't care about any paths, in that next step, we'd actually have two thirds T as our minor we need, but we'd have two A zero paths. So we'd have two T paths. In the next step, we'd have two thirds squared T, so it gets, goes down each time, but then you need to preserve not only the paths at that step, but all previous steps, all kind of ancestor steps. So there'd be two T, and then there'd be two times two thirds T, and so on. And in general, you'd have two thirds to the I times T and two the sum. And crucially, right, if you sum up the powers of two thirds, you get a geometric series and you can bound it by at most six T. So yeah, you have to keep worrying about all the ancestors, but your ancestor paths become less and less to worry about preserving. And so overall, they're not too bad. And after just log log T steps, that left term, the A, goes down to T over log T. And why is that good? Well, Noreen and Song had already shown that those uh, are woven, that they're T over, you know, root log T, uh, you know, 6T woven if you had high enough connectivity. And as long as the chromatic number was large enough, we could do that. And how much did we use in all this process? Because you lose a little at each step. Well, you lose 2S plus 6K times the log log T steps, but K is like, we only need to be on the order of T. So actually, if you do it all out, you get those numbers I had in my lemma. So you just kind of nicely recursively build everything. So that's the separable case. You just always keep separating, always keep separating, always keep delegating until you get to the kind of far enough down that you don't need as high a complete minor, and then you can just use uh, the woven theorem. Very nice. Okay, that's kind of the easy case. How do you do the inseparable case? This is where I was stuck uh, for quite a long while. How do you build a minor sequentially? So here's the plan. We're going to build a KT model, and we're going to do it in Y. So instead of log T quarter, I'm going to up that to square root log T stages. And in each stage, we insert that a set of at x equals t over y new parts are adjacent to every other part. So we're gonna build up the model a little bit at a time in over these stages. To do that, I'll need a definition. So we'll say a model of a graph, a model of h in a graph g is tangent if for every part of the model, there's only one vertex, exactly one vertex in my subgraph. So the idea is I'm kind of gonna kind of build in stages and I'll have some pictures in a second. I mean, it's key that we want only kind of one vertex in the subgraph we're working with to kind of continue extending. So we're kind of, kind of nest. We're gonna start with the big graph, build a little bit, nest, build a little bit, but we're gonna try to make sure the model's there but not really using too much of our smaller and smaller subgraphs. And so here's our goal, uh, as I kind of just explained, for every i and y, we'll extend our kix model hi to a ki plus one x model. So that's the stage, adding all these new parts and adjacent, while well, preserving any old adjacencies. But how do we know we can keep going? So we're gonna to have to ensure that what's left of the graph after you remove the model has large chromatic number. And then we could use the Giraud Norianen to make sure that so it's decently connected. And we're gonna to try to get there. We're gonna to try to move our model and kind of get into that high connected subgraph to keep building. And to do that, we'll just try to make sure that our, our new model is tangent to that subgraph. So that's the plan, kind of sequentially build it, find somewhere to go that still has high chromatic number, high connectivity, and make your, get there, but don't go there too much. Make yourself tangent to that one. Okay, well, all that, again, easier said than done. But step one is actually kind of easy. It's the old plan, but just, just slightly actually shorter. So, you know, since HI is tangent, to, let's say we're in a step I, HI is tangent to GI, so there's exactly one vertex, let's call those the U's. Well, by this density increment corollary, again, I can find lots of small and highly connected. So here we're gonna use omega T connected subgraphs. So here I'm not even gonna do the full string, right? We're building a little, so what you wanna think is I'm gonna build one column at a time of my old picture. That's, that's the real idea. So I'm gonna use H0, I'm gonna use a hub, and I'm gonna do HJI plus one. So I'm gonna build the I plus first column of my old picture. How do we do that? It's the same idea in HJI plus one, I pick a set T that I'm gonna to use to build a model there. And then by Menger's theorem, so I actually don't even need linking because I can use this H zero hub. I can link my U's, that's my, cut all my old model with these new complete sub, uh, new small dense subgraphs, can link them all uh, by, using the H0. And I can also uh, weave, so I didn't write that in, but I can weave, obviously, 
inside of each of the H's complete uh, subgraphs on those. So I weave, I link tied to one call to get to the future, right? I have to keep going. So let's talk about step two. Can we keep going? Do you have large chi in what remains? Well, let's just count up how much chromatic number this stuff used. So the small graphs, you know, if you take those various H's and the U's, I mean, there's only, you know, T, at most T U's, those H's, there's only log T of them. So they have like T log log T chromatic number by the small graphs lemma. So altogether, that's not much. What about the paths? How much do they use? Well, that's where you have to be slightly clever. You should obviously assume the paths are induced when you make them. And then if they're induced, actually they can only use up, you know, two colors and maybe, so maybe that should be 6T because there's at most 3T paths. So, you know, some linear and T number, right? Two colors for each path. There's only a linear number of paths. So that'll be fine. So what remains will actually, have, you've only lost T log log T colors. So that's pretty high. Uh, but how do we make this tangent? And that's the really hard part. So that's where I got stuck. Like option one, you know, do we use Mangers to, so we know this GI plus one exists. We know the future exists. We know, you know, there's this nice highly connected, you can make it high, high chromatic, you can make it highly connected. But how do we get that back to connect up with our, our minor? So could we use Mangers to find the paths from GI plus one to the hub? Well, no because obviously they could intersect the paths, you know, P that we were using. Uh, so that's not gonna work. You might think you could try to start over. You know, now that I know where the future is, now I know where GI plus one is, let's start all over and kind of use Mangers or linkage and try to link that, you know, both my small subgraphs, the past and the future all to the hub. That sounds like a great idea, except it also doesn't work because Basically, you can, if you restart all over, if you start making paths all over, they can cut through the future. They can cut through the GI plus one and that destroy its chromatic number. They can destroy your tangency you're gonna get. So this is just not an option. So this is where I got stuck for quite a long time. How do you, you know, you know where it is, you know where you have to go. How can you make sure you get there? And the trick is you don't make sure you can get there. You make sure it can get to you. So here's the idea, redundancy. So you ensure redundancy, and this is what works. So actually what you do is, you know, we need to make these paths to the hub from the past and the present. You make two paths for each vertex, you know? You make double the paths. So you add in a redundancy. Like you say, oh, I'm gonna, each one has two ways to get to the hub. And then similarly, you use Mangers from the future, from your GI plus one to the hub H0, but double the paths. You make sure everyone from the future can get there in two ways. And then if you understand how Mangers works, a nice application of it is you can actually then get single paths from each. If you guarantee double and double, you can actually get both paths at the same time. You can meet in the middle. And that works. Except in the time after remaining, I have to answer two last questions. I lied. Like, does it actually have large chromatic number? Like, is chi really actually large enough? Because I said, we lose t log log t at each step, but there are square root log t steps. So you would lose like two t square root log t color. That's way too much. So you have to be a little more clever. So this one I knew, you just rebuild the minor at each step. So this is a really nice idea. What, because what does a minor need from each of the HI? You know, if you're just viewing it, it's just some connected subgraph. It doesn't need all that junk. All it needs is the tangent vertex for the future to make sure we can get there. And all of kind of those complete models that it's in, all of, you know, the stuff that's used for its adjacencies. That's all that matters. The paths the connecting them don't matter. And so you can, there's a little lemma you can prove that if I had a connected graph and a special set of terminals I want to keep, then I can find an induced connected subgraph uh, and a subset of the, the, that graph that's small. So basically, I can find, if I, I can keep my special terminals and find a set that's at most three times as large where everything else has a uh, chromatic number at most two. This is a very nice, easy proof. I won't do it, but basically that's enough because basically now we're saying if we rebuild the minor with this lemma, apply it you know, to each part, then well, the important stuff was small, 
So then we've kind of blocked off at most triple that, still small, and everything else had a two chromatic number. So that means when I rebuild it, I only end up uh, losing t log log t in total from my, my step from the small graphs. So I've rebuilt it, you know, and I can find now that what remains of the rebuilding actually has large chromatic number. But this brings us to the last point. Why are you still tangent, right? So we were tangent to what we thought was the future, but then we said we used up too much chromatic number. So now we've, you know, rebuilt and we find a new future, a new GI plus one prime, so that we can use this Dural neuronion to find this new one that's high. But is your model tangent to that one? Maybe not. But basically there are two cases, and this is really nice. Either that future, this G prime I plus one, actually overlaps G I plus one in, in say at least K vertices. Since they're both K connected, you can just smash them together. You'll still be K connected. And then since we avoided the G prime I plus one, you'll actually be tangent to it. And then you can keep going. So kind of if the future and the other future both overlap, then we can actually just declare that and, and move on. The other case is that they're, you know, having most k vertices. So just delete those, say, from g prime i plus one. Now they become vertex disjoint, and they both have large chromatic number. So we found two different vertex disjoint subgraphs with very high chromatic number. That's a contradiction since we assume we're inseparable. So right now, throughout the whole proof, I never used inseparability, but we use it right here at the very end, saying, ah, otherwise we'd have these two large subgraphs. And that concludes the proof when you're doing the sequential case. So sequential, you kind of keep building. Key ideas was this Menger redundancy to, to make sure how to actually get, keep going on, and this re-optimizing, rebuilding the minor to preserve the chromatic number, and naturally out of it comes the uh, inseparability, separability conditions. So again, just summary, uh, we proved that for every beta greater than zero, every graph with no KT minor is OT log T beta colorable. Key dividing into the two cases, always separable, inseparable, using the chromatic number as a resource with that Girao and Yannan theorem. And with the better density increment theorem, which I didn't have the time today to go through all of that because it's also a nice proof and now improved with new versions, we can get figure out the actual uh, number there and it's OT log log T to the sixth colorable which seems very nice. And so future directions, you know, we'd want to improve the density increment theorem, maybe to, to log, or maybe it could even be constant. Could, so unfortunately, uh, in this proof, uh, two of the places, um, yeah, I get stuck. So I can't extend the result to odd minors. It almost all works, but I got stuck, and I couldn't re-extend it to list coloring. Almost all of it works, but I got stuck. But also, eventually, we want to break maybe t log log t, but to do that, we'd actually need to color small graphs better than what we know. And an interesting question is, could you just use connectivity instead of the chromatic number? So with Sergey, for the quarter result, we'd actually shown something stronger, that for every beta greater than quarter, if you're t log t to the beta connected and no kt minor, then the number of vertices is actually very, very small. It's t log t to the seven quarters, which from the small graphs result immediately gives you uh, the theorem without having to do the connection. I mean, of course, we use kind of our strategy in proving this, but it'd be nice if you could actually prove you know, this for t log log t or t log log t to the sixth connected, something like that, and just get it. But I wasn't able to do that either. So that's where I'll, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Luke. Um, so uh, if there are questions, uh, please go ahead and ask them. Maybe I can get us started. Uh, Luke, I was wondering, you know, if I promise you, if I give you a graph and I promise you that it has no KT minor, is there an efficient algorithm for producing a coloring uh, with the number of colors guaranteed by your theorem? Oh yeah, so here, uh, yeah, I think it should all be uh, algorithmic. So you have to understand um, the woven and the bolabash thomason stuff, uh, but I think that's, you know, uh, algorithmic, but basically, yeah, like, I mean, you're the uh, Giraud Narayanan you can view as, um, as I think, all, I think basically the answer is yes, all of it is, uh, can be made to be algorithmic. Um, Thanks. Other questions? If not, um, let's thank Luke again for a, a very nice talk.